fighting soldiers from the sky. Fearless men who jump and die. Men who mean just what they say. The brave men of the Green Beret. Silver wings upon their chest. These are men, America's best. One hundred men will test today. So hello, everybody. Today we have Bob Ramsey back again for his third installment. So thank you, Bob, for joining us again. You're a very easy guy to talk to, and you have some amazing stories about your extensive uh, Special Forces career. So I know that you're eager to uh, to talk about more of that. So what would you like to talk about today? Well, uh, glad to join you, Jason. This has been fun. I never thought it uh, would be like that, but uh, it's not like the confession box or anything. It's really, really quite enjoyable. Uh, well, right off the bat, like last time, I need to make a, a couple of corrections to one of the past interviews. And uh, the first one is I had, I'm sure I had said that the Mac Tam uh, Ingram had been uh, invented by Mitch Orville. I know I said that, and that is not true. He developed it. And guess who invented it? <laughs> a guy named Ingram, right? <laughs> So, so that is a correction I want to make. And the other thing is back on that dry lake bed battle, uh, I wanted to mention that the ground commander was Robert Jacobelli. And uh, he was badly wounded uh, in that uh, battle. Uh, but I uh, wanted to make sure that uh, he was mentioned uh, in that battle. Uh, then I decided... That, and this is largely because a friend who is non-military uh, said that he had watched the interviews and he liked it so much, but would like to have known more about the uh, daily life, I will uh, say, either in garrison or in the field, in the jungle. And uh, I've had a, a quite... Good feedback on this, uh, by the way, Jason. So I got to thinking about that. And so it makes me want to go back to the micros. So if you, uh, if you remember, I uh, was serving in the 8th Special Forces Group in Panama and uh, went from there in 66 straight to the, uh, uh, straight to Vietnam and wound up uh, wound up with the Mike Force, uh, Team Sergeant with the Mike Force. And the Mike Force, I think, could also almost be defined by their club that they had. <laughs> that club was quite the uh, deal for a lot of people. I'll explain that. I have to start with our physical location. We had our own compound. Uh, I had said before, we don't have any LLDB or anybody like that. Us Americans and, uh, and the Mountain Yards. And uh, we controlled access to our compound. Across the street was a C team, which is uh, actually uh, in command of uh, the Mike Force and uh, headed by a Lieutenant Colonel but he didn't really have a lot to do with us. Uh, we could use some of his staff uh, abilities like the oper S3, the operations or the Intel S2, uh, but not a lot of participation uh, over in their side of the road. They had a better club, but we had one that was famous. And I said, people would come in there celebrities would come in there. Where they heard of it, I have no clue, most of them, and asked them, could they come over to the Mike Forrest Club? I guess in another breath and watch the animals or something, I don't know, that kind of thing. But you know, John Wayne was one. 
And uh, he got a lot of his um, his material uh, from that visit with the Mike Force. Uh, but I remember one day that I was out uh, out in the sticks training with uh, three company uh, by myself with uh, just a company and a couple of American helpers. And we were coming back, marching back in a long haul back to play coup when I got a message that there was an inbound chopper. And so I said, okay, I have no idea why we had an inbound chopper, but here they came and I saw in the doorway some strange looking person that had on what looked like brand new tiger stripes and, uh, and a funny hat and all that kind of thing. Well, they landed and uh, when the dust cleared, I was looking at Don Meredith, who is a famous footballer with the Dallas Cowboys and then became a well-known uh, radio announcer. And so they had come over and uh, wanted to see the Mike Force. And so uh, here we had them for a few days. And uh, another one was Robert Mitchum from, uh, from uh, yeah, and we, he really loved us. And when he came over there, when those people would come over there to the club, um, there would be, they would make a phone call or sometimes even show up at our gate looking for access and we would turn them away. And a lot of them, but not the celebrities like Robert Mitchum. He, he wanted to go party with everybody. He was a hard drinker. And we wound up going to, taking him to town. When we were uh, uh, in stand down, we would sometimes go in and terrorize play coup ourselves, but uh, I won't cover a lot of nitty gritty there. But, uh, <laughs> but Robert uh, Mitchum really had a blast and he was quite a wild guy. And uh, it kind of reminded me of a story I want to tell. I've always enjoyed this, this story a lot of pe other people have, but we did not have vehicles in the Mike Force. So if we needed a vehicle for something, we had to borrow from the seat team. They had vehicles. So it had come to pass that when we borrowed the Jeep and the Jeep belonged to the, the, the boss, the seat team commander, and we needed the Jeep, it seems like we would bring it back and it was often be damaged. You know, well, it came to a kind of a red line point with him and he said, if anybody uh, takes that Jeep and wrecks it, we are going to have a guillotine set up for you or whoever does it. And so we probably, oh no, Colonel, we'll never damage that Jeep again. Well, this wasn't long after that dry lake bed battle and, uh, and the yards wanted their victory uh, party. Have you, have you heard of a victory party, Jason? The mountain oh, yeah. thing? Okay, well, they collect up all of these non pay jars, you know, the mountain yard wine, and, uh, and, and we're going to have food, but it, it's going to come in on the hoof. And uh, they, for that reason, they needed a water buffalo. And so I got stuck with uh, obtaining the water buffalo. Well, I got talking to our yards and we finally found out a, a village not far from Pleiku where we could get a uh, water buffalo. So I took the Jeep and a uh, half ton truck uh, out with this village and, um, and right away the, the village uh, head guy came up and he had, must have had word of us coming or, uh, or somehow. And he had brought this little uh, puppy on a leash and uh, handed it to me. And I just thought that was the nicest, nicest thing. Well, it turned out that puppy was going to be lunch. Uh, and uh, oh. of course, I had to try a little bit of it, you know, for the sake of uh, being compatible and everything. But that's another side. The Buffalo uh, Exchange, the money, uh, was dealt with fairly fast and we now own the buffalo. So buffalo's got to be put on that truck. So we're thinking like, 
how in the hell are you going to get a buffalo that big on the back of that truck? The tailgate is like three feet off the ground. And so we're puzzling about that when somebody said, oh, you know, you need to go get the uh, end of the dike and lead the buffalo up on the dike and then uh, position him at the back of the truck and just uh, put him on a truck. Well, we did that, except the damn buffalo would not get on the truck. He just was, he was there and defiant. He was not getting on that thing. So now we're have a quandary again. So what in the world are we gonna do? So one of the yard says, go get so-and-so. He is the, the buffalo witch doctor or whatever he was. So he comes up there and he looks and he looks and says, mm, yeah. And he has this sharp pointed stick and he jabbed that buffalo in the rear with that stick. And that buffalo took off into the bed of the truck, onto the cab of the truck, onto the hood of the truck. And then he jumped off on a Colonel's Jeep. <laughs> and I had to go back in there with that damaged Jeep and say, well, sir, a buffalo jumped on it, you know. That was, everybody had to laugh about that, even the colonel, you know. Wow. And so we had, uh, we had the buffalo uh, after he was ritually killed, which was quite gruesome. And uh, they went around, they had something where you had to take your boot off and they poured buffalo blood on your foot. And then you had to drink all this non-pay, and they would measure how much you drank. They had this little stick, and you had to clear the level of the non-pay before you could get, get away from that nasty stuff. And in the meantime, you're getting, you know, quite a buzz off this stuff. And uh, uh, so uh, I hope everybody likes that, uh, that Buffalo story, though. And I say, who else showed up? Oh, Martha Ray, twice that I remember. And she was always there, a hard drinker she was. And um, let me think of what I have forgotten here. I got a few notes there. And, Martha, uh, Martha yeah. Ray, just to, just to talk about Mar Martha Ray, you know, she, she uh, for the younger people, you know, she was a very, very famous Hollywood actress. And, yeah. uh, and then she became kind of a comedian, right? And she was kind of a, yeah. um, but she really loved, loved you guys, you know, and, and you loved her. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'd heard many stories and one fr from our mutual friend, uh, David Carr, uh, he was quite good friends with her. And uh, she always had her her house open to any SF guy. And uh, yeah, she sounded like a very special lady. But, she, you know, every guy, SF guy that I've talked to who said, oh, yeah, I had a drink with uh, with, with Martha. Not one guy has said to me that he was able to out drink her. Oh, very true. And she drove, drank straight vodka. You know? yeah. And you mentioned David Carr. He's a real good friend of mine. You know, yeah. what a great guy David is. And we go back and forth with, uh, and we don't live that far apart. He's in Phoenix and we visited, I can't remember when it was, but yeah, I love David. I really do. But anytime also um, that a band would come into uh, play coup, the C team, uh, to put on a performance, which they did often. They would put on the performance, but then they wanted to go to the Mike Force Club. You know? And so we had all of these kind of things in between trips to the jungle. And, uh, and the, the, that club was a wild place, it really was. And I understand that when the Mike Force switched over to a larger unit that they named that club after a guy, uh, Club Manny, I think it was. I, I don't know who the guy who was, uh, I know who they're talking about, but he was right. killed as soon as he arranged or arrived at the, the uh, Mike Force. But they switched into B20, Bravo 20. Right. And it went from three rifle companies to three battalions, I think it was, with each having their own uh, their own rifle companies. And uh, yeah, there was a lot of my force work to be done over there. And I kind of amazed how we got so much done. And, uh, but 
uh, in garrison, it was it was pretty wild. We had a diet of namely anything that we wanted. It was a lot of lobster, a lot of steak wow. at the point where you got tired of it, you know. But our supply man would take weapons and go down to uh, the other military installations and trade for all of these cases of uh, whiskey and cases of steaks and lobster and all this kind of stuff. It, it was really a memory. Uh, but, now, I, uh, now, I know that some of the guys who, who were behind the enemy lines, they were always asking you, SF guys, or anybody in the front line for like, you know, you know a VC flag. And I've heard so many stories about that the guys, you guys, would shoot them with them and then put some, you know, chicken blood on them and then trade them for other things, <laughs> you know, like, so they weren't really, they they were acquired on the battlefield, but they made them a little bit more, ooh, you know, a little more drama to them, right? Yeah. No, I cannot say we were guilty of that. I've heard of that same thing, but no, we didn't do any of that. I, probably nobody thought of it. <laughs> we might have. But um, now, did you guys meet any any of the of the Playboy, uh, you know, bunnies? Did they ever? No, come there? no, no, that was too bad. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, no. But, you know, we would have strange people in that club, too, like the A1E pilots that supported us would right. come over there. The fat controllers would come over there. And uh, it was just it was just one memory after the other. When I got there, the, the commander was Clyde Sincere. Okay, yeah. I, uh, I spent a lot of time in the jungle with Clyde. The longest time was uh, doing those blackjack missions, the, uh, the uh, mobile guerrilla force uh, missions, uh, because the third company, which I was nominally in charge of, unless it was going to the field and then they would put, uh, we'd get an officer or two. Now, we didn't have any officers, though. And um, so, yeah, the time out in that uh, field was uh, sincere was was long. And a longer one's coming up when Chuck Fry, who I loved like a brother, I really did. He died not long ago. He was an old friend from the 8th Special Forces Group, or, or Bragg before that. Wow. And he was he was uh, one of the plank owners from the... Uh, the tenth in Germany, one of the he was a sergeant first class then, and uh, and then was later commissioned. But yeah, he was a one of the first SF guys, and um, we went on a uh, uh, quite a long uh, stay behind mission with uh, with Chuck Fry, and uh, and it turned out very successful. But those things were quite hard, you know. And my friend that wanted to know uh, more about what a day was like in the jungle, uh, I'll try and uh, tap on that a bit. Uh, you know, to start with, uh, you know, uh, uniforms, uh, you don't wear socks and you don't wear uniform or underwear, uniforms, t shirts, and, and that because uh, you want to do your best to. Uh, stay out of these horrible jungle rashes. Just about everybody came back with those things and also a, a, a bad stomach situation, uh, often amoebic dysentery. And the reason for that was that on one of those mobile guerrilla force operations, we, uh, we did not get uh, resupplied like the regular units where they would bring bottles of water and that kind of stuff. We had to find our own water, and, and often it was a little scummy covered pond or something. Or, and even this stuff that looked good, you knew was uh, ripe with Agent Orange and God knows what else over there. So, um, yeah, a lot of our guys came down with cancer, uh, and that was uh, kind of rough. But, yeah, and then uh, we had talked about leeches on a previous uh, interview, but... Uh, one of the things that you did in Garrison for this friend, John, that asked me to talk more about the Mike Force part, uh, you might make sure that the bottoms of your trousers were soaked with insect repellent, you know, that would keep these 
land leeches from walking up and uh, glomming onto you with uh, that little nasty mouth. <laughs> and, uh, uh, although we hated those things. And, but if you were still long enough, you could get dozens of them on you. And uh, we did not sleep in hammocks or anything like that. It was on the ground the whole time, six weeks of that. And, uh, and uh, it, you know, people lost weight and got sick from different things. And, uh, but uh, John, we would move into this area and uh, one of the first things to do was to put out some mini patrols to make sure there wasn't anything looming near you that you didn't want to see. And uh, because we had a particular mission in the, those blackjack missions and uh, we didn't want to get destroyed before them. So we had to be very careful about, because uh, we were dumped into the NBA base areas. Uh, so they were bad guys all around, plenty to spare. And uh, so we would stay on the ground, so many alert at night. If the mini patrols came back in, we could put out listening posts and claim our mines and then set how many uh, were to be awake during the uh, stay there, which is usually one night and it was always one night. And then up and at them uh, at dawn, uh, but that was no biggie because you still had the same clothes on, didn't you? <laughs> and, uh, uh, and it was a, it was a, a physically kind of a rough thing like that. And uh, the rations we had in the field, uh, I mentioned. Did I mention that on another interview? Jason? Yeah, but you, but you can talk about it, you know, again. Yeah. Okay. Well, the uh, the dried uh, uh, indig rations for the CIDG civilian uh, irregular force that we hired like mercenaries. And they got five uh, meals. Each meal would have a bag of rice that had to be reconstituted and would have some kind of protein thing. Uh, my favorite was dried squid and minnows with hot sauce, that was really good. And uh, let's see, the other ones was mutton, that was a bad one and a uh, beef sausage. Let's see, that's one, two, three, four. There was a shrimp and mushroom and all these things reconstituted with water. But then again, that water that we got, um, you know, it, you had to be pretty sparing with your water. And, you know, nowadays in hiking, they push drinking water to, is so important. You know, back then we tried to conserve water as much as we could. A lot of the weight we carried was water, water and ammunition. Uh, those are the two most important things to us out in those operations like that. And uh, uh, I think from there that I might be able to leave the mic force behind, unless Jason, you have some questions um, um, about the blackjacks or or anything. No. I think, I, I, uh, you know, what I find really interesting about the special forces is just your ability to live off the land. And so, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you're um, in an environment, so this time we'll talk about the jungle, still water is always the one that you want to try and avoid. As long as there's some movement to the water, you have a better chance of that being less infected, right? So they say. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I just thought of, you just generated another story of mine. And this one was on a field training exercise in Panama with Chuck Fry. And uh, he, Chuck and I were together on this thing. Well, we were supposed to be, like you say, live off the land, super SF hero kind of guys. Well, they gave us rice, but this was a long uh, field exercise too. But the only thing that we could gather or catch were armadillos. And, uh, and, and we had this saying developed after so many armadillos that uh, the slogan in Spanish was an armadillo for each uh, casa, you know, and for each house and wild oranges. So we had a lot of armadillo and uh, I don't know why we bothered to eat them, you know. 
I guess it was just a show off thing or something. I don't, I don't know, but you could catch them because if you would run up on them, you could outrun them and they would stop and start trying to dig in. Man, those guys would dig a hole like you couldn't believe before you grabbed them and pull them out. They'd be halfway gone. Wow. But, uh, yeah, Chuck Fry, another great memory with uh, Chuck Fry. And um, so, uh, you know, uh, again, I think I might go ahead and, uh, and start talking about leaving the mic for us. Well, it was back to Fort Bragg, Echo Company of the 7th. And uh, that, was a, uh, that was a good time. I think I described some of the things we did uh, before, so I'm not going to uh, talk about those again. Uh, but uh, we did a lot of training and a lot of some civic action kind of things and uh, support for uh, field problems uh, where we were the aggressors and, and things like that. And, uh, but about a year and a half after I returned and was in, in the seventh group, I got orders for, uh, uh, for Vietnam and uh, went over there. And um, I think I discussed this before uh, but I'll mention it one more time. I got there and they were, they were sending all the SF people to other units. Well, they did me and this other fellow a, a, a favor, so to speak, by sending us to uh, uh, the 5th Mech Ranger Company. And uh, because we could draw a jump pay like that. So that was the favor they were doing us. Well, we weren't there long before I ran into to, uh, Frank Hobbs that I told you about how he re recruited me and, uh, and took me back and uh, assigned me as the uh, uh, North Platoon Sergeant. And uh, the commander was David Carr and uh, great rapport with David. He, um, he really supported everything. And everything could be all kinds of strange stuff in a garrison with the uh, commanding north. Um, you know, we had several different kinds of indigenous people for uh, for the t recon teams. Now we also had strike forces too. You know, company and platoon size. But the recon company where I was in David Carr, uh, it was just strictly recon. And uh, we were out of country all the time uh, after the um, uh, after the switch over when the when they uh, limited the number of SF over there. Uh, it was in I think the the beginning of seventy I think or no beginning of seventy one where they went from um, Command and Control North to Task Force Three something or other. Yeah, T T T F what whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. and uh, but we would have all these different uh, teams of, and they were all uh, unique in that they had uh, all the team members would be one indigenous ethnic uh, race. So we had we had Vietnamese, we had. Uh, we had Cambodians, we had Brews, and sometimes those guys uh, would get to fighting over stuff. Usually, the girls in their mess hall or card games. They like to uh, gamble all the time, and you had to go up there and stop gunfights often after uh, those people would, because they had their weapons and all that kind of stuff they slept with. Wow. And, uh, I never, no, I didn't remember any kind of uh, fatalities or anything like that. Um, but you would have to often make peace between uh, a brew team and a uh, and a Vietnamese team. One other type of team was a North Vietnamese, former North Vietnamese. Um, soldier, my mouth is so dry for some reason. Do you want to? Uh, you want to have a drink? 
Uh, let me just get a, a some. So while cool. so while the while that you're doing that, um, I'll tell the people that in uh, the where you were at CCN that there was um, a team that was called uh, uh, RT Cobra, and RT Cobra had all of those former VC or you know, and um, and then the man who was running it, he was uh, half half Asian and half uh, uh, you know European, so apparently he could. Uh, I think Eddington, his, his name was. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, last name so yeah. I've, I've heard some stories about about him too which are interesting but they're yeah for not not for you not for viewers you know okay well i think you know i i just think of everybody where there were were legends i don't care yeah what position they held on the team that uh uh those people that actually volunteered for that and we all were uh multiple volunteers you know to, and uh and then somebody, you know, said that uh, they never heard of anybody being assigned to a team that was not SF qualified. Well, that's not true. We had a guy that Hobbs recruited uh, from across the street when he was a, a gate guard. And I think he was only a PFC or something. But that guy turned into quite the soldier, you know. And um, uh, so that's one that I know didn't... Uh, be SF qualified. I thought when you were talking about the the team and and Cobra, I thought you were talking about Dutch Waringa who died a year ago or so. I was great friends with him, and uh, boy, you talk about a background. Oh my goodness, there's a book out that people need to, and you'd never know there was anything like it about Dutch. You know, he was such a humble guy, and uh, but all the stuff that he did and. Uh, did after retiring from the service uh, with uh, the CIA and the Secret Service and everything. Really amazing kind of stuff. Well, on that, so, on that note, his, um, I just got to speak to his uh, wife, his, uh, his uh, second wife, and um, I, I can put you in touch with her. Um, so she was uh, very, uh, very happy to be part of the uh, Facebook page. You know, so uh, yeah, she she's on there. So okay, yep. Uh, I think she gave me if it's the same gal. Uh, a while back, gave me uh, established a contact with Dutch that never got done. You know, yeah. he was always so busy, I guess. And uh, uh, but I saw him a couple of times after he retired. Uh, one time at a, uh, a kind of a reunion thing, and uh, but by that time he was. Uh, he was getting on in years by that time. And he was at SOAR, uh, not the last one, but the one before that. And I just missed him. He, he went back early. He was selling his book and uh, went back early. And everybody knew him from CCN said, you wouldn't recognize Dutch. And uh didn't matter to me what he looked like. He was right. my friend. He was my friend. So... Being a, a uh, recon platoon sergeant actually made you kind of a, you were kind of, I think I said before, a mother hen kind of uh, uh, position. And um, go ahead. I see you wanted to say something. Well, it's funny because uh, years ago that you sent me something from your Mike Force days and they were all code names. And your code name, wasn't it Papa Bear or Mama Bear or, yeah. or, or, or something like that, right? Yeah. Mama Bear. Yeah, that was. <laughs> yeah. I guess that was. They were thinking of honoring my my position on the team. You know, the, the team sergeant team. Uh, the one, a guy who really didn't like that was uh, nicknamed Bucky Beaver. You know, and you know that reminds me of another funny thing: being out in the jungle uh, on one of those blackjacks. Um, you would think up some really weird stuff. You out there, maybe it was the water. I don't know what it was, but you could come up with some great stuff. And here's one that we had uh, asked for a fact, and um, we got one over uh, over our head. Uh, for the air controller, I'm talking about. We need to put in an airstrike. So the guy comes in and uh, he's. He started calling on the radio, and all of a sudden, he, 
is this really true with you Americans? We had codenamed ourselves after flowers, all of us. One guy was a pansy, another guy was a, a daisy, one guy was, and man, I, we hadn't heard about that for a long time. With, uh, and we were great friends with that fact anyway, and or a couple of them actually. And they uh, really enjoyed uh, uh, dancing to the tune of a bunch of flowers on the ground, you know. Oh, I just like that stuff uh, too good. And um, did I talk about kidnapping Master, Master Jovis from the 75th Back Hospital? Nope. <laughs> oh, that's, uh, that is one of the, I probably should not talk about that. I might be uh, uh, put in jail over it yet, but poor Master Joseph died just not too long ago. Uh, I saw it in uh, Bonnie's uh, taps where he had, he had died. But he, um, oh, by the way, the other NBA team was ASP with Gary Robb. Of course, yeah. yeah. Right. And um, so before Dugan and Master Joseph, Dugan was a lieutenant. He's gone too. And uh, Master Joseph uh, got dealt a POW snatch mission. And so Master Joseph went around saying, Man, I'd give my right testicle to get one. Well, make a long story short, guess what happened to him? And he lived, but wound up in a hospital and, of course, you know, put out of the military, uh, badly injured and stuff like that. But he was over in the hospital and we used to go visit the guys when they were in this American hospital. And uh, so we got to kind of celebrate maybe too much in the club because uh, CCN had a great club there too, a recon company club. And um, so we had decided we were going to go see Master Joseph. Well, we got that. We got an ambulance. The medical section had an ambulance. So we went over there with uh, that ambulance and another uh, couple of vehicles and uh, went to see Master Joseph. And we went in there and there he was and uh, all bandaged up and everything. And we said, Master Joseph, we need you to come back to the club with us. So we loaded Master Joseph into the ambulance. Nobody saw us doing that, of course. And uh, we took him back over to the club and, you know, he drank a couple of drinks too. I don't think that was very smart, you know, being all shot up drinking. Uh, drinking whiskey and whatever he drank. Uh, but turned out it didn't hurt him. And I saw him at a, uh, a sore uh, a few days back. I don't go to all the sores. And uh, and he and I uh, reminisced, reminisced uh, is that a word? I think it's a word. And uh, over uh, that operation, uh, kidnapped Master Joseph. <laughs> and they did get the POW, by the way. <laughs> So after that was his was his uh, call sign you know one one nut. <laughs> it probably should have been was he able to stay, but uh, but no, that wasn't it. Now, do I talk about uh, one of the first things I did when I got there was uh, I needed to go out on one of the recon teams, track hang on one of the strap hang uh, on one of the teams. And I picked Cliff Newman, uh, RT Ohio, uh, as a team to go. And I believe that that team would have been so polished and so capable in every little way that I wanted to enjoy what I was learning and seeing. So I went out with Cliff. We did a seven day, uh, no bullets, nobody, uh, nobody injured. And got it, lots of intel to bring back. And that was the way an RT was supposed to operate. We weren't a mic force, you know. You were not supposed to get into contact and if you could avoid it. But uh, that time we didn't, uh, we didn't have any problems with that. We all came back successful missions and, uh, and that made me shine a little bit with the rest of the teams at this, this uh, mother hen could go out in the sticks with them. So the next thing I went out and uh, was with uh, Gary Robb and R.T. Asp. 
I think it might be time to talk about that, isn't it? Okay. I know uh, there's been a couple of write-ups. Uh, did I send you the one that uh, John Warren did for me? Not yet, no. Okay, I'm going to send you that one. It's uh, it's very much it's the tail like you put in a pucker factor, you know. So anyway, I'll talk about the uh, that. And uh, Gary Robb was a captain. He had previously served in the Phoenix program. And he had done a lot of running before I got there. And he always ran by himself, uh, which was, you know, which was okay. And he was very successful. And uh, everybody looked up to him as far as, and I had a great rapport with uh, Gary. And uh, I always remember him, I would be making rounds. It was always, oh, the training schedules, oh my God, to get, uh, some recalcitrant RT10 wouldn't turn in his, uh, his training schedule on top. And the training sergeant uh, would ask my help with doing that. Well, Gary called me the b balloon sergeant all the time, you know, which, uh, which it was fine, but we developed a good bit of rapport. So one day he came up to me and he said, you know, this is very quiet right now. But I've been offered a uh, parachute insertion. And the reason that was brought up is because uh, we were having one hell of a time getting teams on the ground. They were getting shot out of every LZ. They were, uh, they were tracked and uh, put into a, uh, a prairie fire situation. Prairie fire was immediate, asked for immediate extraction, big problems. Uh, be put in a prairie fire situation. Uh, so um, what was I talking about? <laughs> you know, I saw about Gary Rock. Yeah. And, uh, and he came to me and he said, uh, how would you like to do this, uh, this parachute insertion? And again, the reason for it was the problems getting in people on the ground. So they wanted to try one. Now, this was the first jump that CCN had ever made into the AO. And um, so once I agreed to that, Rob told the wheels that, that it was a go. And the two of us, Rob always ran by himself until he asked me. So I think that was very flattering that I was asked. And uh, so it, we were put into a, a green light status and started training on this uh, uh, team uh, situation being a, we were going to take just two commandos with us, both XNVA and Rob and I, four man team. And uh, we had decided after talking about this, uh, that we wanted to go uh, in their uniform. And yes, it's true that they had to uh, make two uniforms out to make me one. I was a good bit over six foot. And, uh, and so there we were all dressed out in NVA. Uh, the current NVA, we knew what the current design was. So we were okay with that. Uh, folding stock AKs, and uh, we carried very little with us. Uh, I think we just had a couple of bags of rice, a lot of ammo, like all the teams did, and and water, of course, you know. And uh, uh, yeah, that team, that seven days with Newman, we didn't even find any water out there. But anyway, so we trained very hard, the four of us, on IA drills and things like that. And then it came time to uh, go to Long Ton and practice the actual jumps. And we had decided that we were gonna go in low because that would better the chance of linking up. And for a parachute insurgent to link up, you must 
or success, you must be able to link up. And that goes for a recon team or a, re, or a, a division or whatever. If you can't link up and continue your mission, uh, it's, it's been, the mission has been discarded in most uh, cases. So we had decided on 400 feet. Well, Long Time had a hissy fit over that. We could only talk them into 800 feet. So we did several jumps at 800 feet to practice the use of this beacon system where uh, Rob would carry this uh, uh, beacon uh, that would emit a signal and it had an antenna that you ran up and he would initiate th these signals and we had these little Panasonic radios that you could dial in uh, and find the signal wave on there and you would look for the no and once you found the no then you followed that little Panasonic baby right to the beacon and it worked 100% every time and uh, that is until an actual jump. <laughs> but I'll hopefully mention that. So we, we decided that, okay, 800 is best we could do, but that was so polished uh, that we would uh, be able to thank Long Time for their jumps and we would go back and, uh, and get ready to go. Uh, Jumpmaster was uh, at Long Time was an old friend of mine that I knew very well and had served on a team with me in Bolivia, uh, Frank Norbury. He was tragically killed in a, a skydiving exercise uh, way before his time. So we waited until the, um, the uh, darkest night of the, the month and the darkest time and we coordinated with the uh, Air Force to give us a black 130. And uh, we went into a, a, an isolation phase uh, where we just checked out everything we could think of to check out equipment, weapons, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, parachutes, yeah, we wanted to look at those too. We didn't bother with reserves because at 400 feet, they wouldn't do you any good. Uh, so you just had to cross your fingers and hope that that canopy inflated because uh, I will tell you that when we did this job, it was like crack fell up into the ground, you know, just that fast with the chute popping open and you hitting the ground, there was hardly any time at all. And, but nobody was hurt. And uh, uh, the one thing that, that didn't go well though. Oh, I want to go back to isolation. When it came time to load the airplane, I always forget or remember how the Air Force crew chiefs looked when he saw these four NVA dress guys walking at his tailgate, his C-130. So that was a funny time too. So we get up there and this is going to be a, a, a drop. I had flown a recon over the area with a uh, with a fact a couple of days before, but that, you know, that really didn't do any good. We just saw a lot of uh, jungle tops in that, uh, in that area there. And uh, it was a bit mountainous too. The terrain was uh, a bit rough. In fact, our mission had been to, uh, to see if there were any NVA forces in this area that we were going to jump into because they had gotten uh, some radio uh, communications uh, coming out of there and uh, they wanted to make sure that it wasn't a dummy station, which they did some, or a real uh, grouping of NVA outfits. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so um, we got on the 130 and we went at dead reckoning uh, meaning we're going to fly on a beacon uh, straight enough on time and the time would tell when we got the green light to jump. We tailgated the four of us. Gary went first. I uh, pushed from the, as a fourth guy, the two uh, 
commandos in front of me. Well, we got on the ground and did the best we can. I mean, it was so dark. You couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. That was good. And uh, so we tried to stuff our uh, canopies and uh, under some underbrush if we could hide them best we can. And then we followed the Panasonics up, which were great. Uh, I was the next one up uh, with Gary and then one of the commandos. And then we were sitting there, couldn't figure out what happened to the other commandos because he should have been before the, the first one. And it turned out that he had somehow broken the wire uh, that held his earpiece to the Panasonic radio, radio and he couldn't locate that beam. And so, uh, but fortunately we were about to move. And when we moved, he heard out he was just a stone's throw from, from us anyway, and we picked him up uh, like that. But uh, when uh, it, we grouped up and uh, we just kind of stayed trying to get our bearings uh, organized. And when it started just before dawn, we started, uh, there was just a little glimmer of light in the sunrise. And uh, we started hearing all this noise up on this, uh, on this hill that was really the end of this ridge that we were on. We were on a uh, ridge that traveled up to that uh, high point, that elevated point. So right away, we're very concerned about all that noise and it, it grew lighter. You could see lots of, you could hear lots of noise, pans banging around and all kind of stuff. And then the next thing, it wasn't long before, you know, we heard some people coming towards us. And as we, um, as we sat there, we counted like a hundred feet legs. I mean, a pair of legs that were marching down this trail. And I had crossed that trail. No, Gary had crossed it too uh, on uh, initial uh, grouping. Uh, we did not recognize that as a trail, but we had cut that trail and, uh, and watched these people come out of the, uh, they were soldiers, uh, obviously, uh, come out of that. So, then the next thing that happened, basically, we're in this big field of uh, elephant grass, real thick and tall. And the next thing we know is uh, there was a combination of noise that kept closer to us from that hilltop. There was somebody, for some reason, entering that, that field of grass. And then the fact told us that there was a force coming at us from the other side. And it, it obvious that they somehow had to know that they had a team in that area and they were gonna find us. And uh, they were real concerned about that. One of the tricks that, that was done uh, throughout enemy held territory north uh, was used a lot, but into the AOs too they would put an ice block and a parachute harness and drop it in so that it looked like uh, that somebody had infiltrated there and, because the ice would melt and, uh, and it would just be the harness and canopy and no, no infiltrator there. So they obviously wanted to see what was going on uh, about that field of grass. And I, don't, I really don't want to talk about what we did in that field of grass. I just am not interested in sharing that until we got the fact telling us, uh, you need to get out of there. Uh, a prairie fire was called to get us out of there. And the fact got us a place where a helicopter could land not far from us. And so as we left that field of grass to get on that chopper, which was just, I don't know, 20, meters away from us where it landed. But we, as we were getting out of the, uh, the, the grass, uh, we started taking fire as did the helicopter. And so here, I don't know what the helicopter thought. Again, here's a bunch of Vietnamese clothed people running at them, you know. And, uh, it, but we got on the, the chopper was hit a good number of times but nothing uh, lethal. 
And of course we didn't. And we got to fire a few shots at them too. And then we got to call in an awful lot of airstrikes on that hilltop and uh, all the surrounding area. So that was a successful mission. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, we might have been one of the only ones, the only team. I've been told we were the only team that satisfied their mission. And the mission was to see if there was any NVA in this area. And, and lo you, and behold, yeah. You found them. <laughs> we found them. And uh, uh, so that was, that is such a memory. Gary and I, over the years, became really close. Uh, was truly a brother I never had. And he said the same thing. And uh, so, you know, Gary died. You know about that, right? Uh, on a ski, ski lift, pulmonary embolism killed him on the ski lift. And they were sick in his life, always very fit. This goes to show you, you can't tell. So I keep up with Catherine, his wife, uh, a lot. Oh, she sent me some feedback that she liked uh, one of the inter interviews we did. Good. And said she never had realized some of this stuff, the history, because Gary never talked about it, you know. And he was a very humble guy, too. He, he didn't want. Gary sent me one, uh, one, one of these, you know, uh, yeah, which was very nice of him. And uh, and the uh, op, Ops 35 SOG. Yeah. That one. And then I think there was one more that he sent, which I, I can't find right, right now, but that was really cool. About a bumper or license plate thing. I'm sorry. A license plate with uh, the. No, those? no, no. But this just, yeah. I mean that. Okay. You know, and and just so people know what these are, the public may may not know. These are called uh, challenge coins, and every it's not just SOG, but every uh, unit, uh, military unit in the U.S. Uh, Army and Navy and Air Force, they all have their own challenge coins. And correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, but if you're in a bar and if you with other fellow veterans and, and serving guys, do you have your challenge coin on you? And if you don't and they do, guess who's paying the drinks, right? That's correct. <laughs> yeah. That's correct. <laughs> OK, one of the things, a couple of things before I leave SOG, uh, while we're at CCN, we had a commander named Donahue. And Colonel Donahue, I thought, was probably a fast mover. He was a West Pointer. He was on the top percent list. And I thought was a, a fine commander from, you know, it wasn't his job to go out and do recon. But anyway, it was not long after he left that it was discovered that he had acquired all of these medals and uh i think he was the story is that he was forced to resign but allowed to resign with his pension so i what a shock because that uh i thought i never would have dreamed that he would be one to do that but he and a clerk uh at awards and decorations uh, got together on that kind of stuff and uh, they were kind of stingy with uh, decorations and stuff when I was there. And Gary and I didn't get anything. And uh, we didn't even get a letter of thanks. You know? And uh, it wasn't until a, uh, a general uh, at Fort Bragg uh, had us for a two-day uh, celebration. And uh, uh, I'm looking for a word. Uh, recognition of the people that had made jumps into the AO. And of course, we were followed by uh, a couple of halo jumps. Uh, Chris Newman, who I love like a brother too, was uh, the, on the first halo. And none of the halo missions uh, worked. They were just all scattered all over everywhere. 
uh, it's amazing they got all their peel back after a fashion, but uh, uh, those didn't work very well. I don't know why somebody thought they might do that, but you know, if you knew what, what it was really like just to jump on a, no DZ, no, uh, no, no, you didn't know what was below you when you did these jumps. Could have been anything, you know. Uh, same for anybody that jumped. Halo, static line, didn't matter. It was, uh, it was, it was luck, I guess, that kept you from like landing smack in the middle of some cooking pot thing. <laughs> I keep thinking about those cannibals with their great big cartoon witch pot or in the in your shoot. But uh, oh. yeah, Donahue left and. Uh, and we got a, uh, a a good commander there, but we also got this this XO who was a lieutenant colonel who was a real jerk. And I remember one of the things he did when he he had just got there and he had no background in anything, and uh, was trying to establish his uh, his uh, credentials with us, I guess. So we were hastened up to the theater Neiman theater uh, movie theater where there was a stage and there was a, um, a, a set of bleachers and stuff where they did movies all the time. Uh, oh, the yards were funny. They loved the spaghetti westerns, you know. But anyway, we went down there and here was all these mounds of something covered with sheets on this, uh, on this stage. And this guy went up to one of them and he started, he yanked it off and it was a bunch of... Uh, uh, it was a bunch of uh, cameras. And he said, you guys left this in the AO. He walked another one. Pop. You guys left all these weapons in the, uh, in the AO. And bop. Several more kinds of things. Talking about stuff. Yeah, there was stuff. So I asked, I said, Where's the, where is the, the sheet for all the bodies out there? the humans. Well, that didn't make me very much of a friend with this guy, you know, so uh, so I knew he had his eyes on me for a long time. In fact, when Gary and I got back to uh, Da Nang, the Chief Sog wanted us down there immediately to talk about the jump. Because like I say, it was the first one to go in uh, that north, you know. That, that was a, uh, that AO was rough. And so we went down there and had our uh, interview with Chief Sog. And, you know, that's all he wanted to do was uh, talk about the job. And he'd talk about uh, what kind of training we did up to the point and just general knowledge like that. Very nice. And um, when we got back uh, to Da Nang, we had found out that this guy, with Mr. Sheets guy uh, was thinking we had gone to uh, Chief Sog to rat him out as a bad officer, you know, which we didn't say a word about him, you know. And, uh, but that's the kind of guy he was, you know, paranoid, you know, thought we were down there to rat on him. And, uh, but I remember he dressed he had civilian breasts like a lot of people and he would show up around with bell bottoms and uh and and the shirts like you know the disco era people wore all this stuff and boy nobody liked that at all you know and uh, uh i think the most of the music that was played there was country western stuff and um uh i think that was uh a sight to have get rid of that guy, or, or I left there without uh, much else to say. Um, I want. I think I'm missing something here. So but, just to just to give you a time check. I mean, I'm not. I'm not definitely not stopping you from doing anything. But we are at an hour, um, <laughs> and we do like to try and keep these two to an hour. Um, it's up to you. Do you do you want to tell one one more story and then come back in a couple more weeks to to do another another chapter or what would you? Well, you know, well the the only thing that I have left in my 
life in the military was after uh, after uh, Vietnam was over, what happened to me, I stayed in SF the whole time. It different, some of it was really interesting there. I think let's call it an hour. Okay, yeah, I think that's best because I, um, other people like to do a couple hours. I like to do it because I like an hour because everyone's fresh. And, yeah. um, you know, two hours is like a full movie, right? And uh, not yeah. everybody has that much time. And also, I don't want to push you into a, a, a confined uh, time space to, you know, to encompass your whole career. So why don't we do that? We'll conclude yeah. this one for, for today. And then in a couple of weeks, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do another one. Yeah, I got a few stories for the rest of my time. Yeah, yeah. I like, you know, um, okay. I, I really like the stories that you tell. Uh -huh. And I also like that you're offering a lot of your past, but there's still a privacy, which, which, which I respect. And so you're kind of giving the public an, uh, a, a better understanding than they ever had prior. But there's some elements that people don't need to know. It's, a, it's of no historical or they won't gain anything from it. So I think that's cool as well. Yeah. You know, there's stories about about myself that I wouldn't want to, everybody to know, you know, it's of no, you know, no value. Right. And it's, uh, Yeah. So for today, the one, thing, the one thing I'd like to add at the end, since you mentioned it, was, you know, I I came into this and I was not going to talk about gunfights. You know, uh, I haven't yet, despite the, uh, talking about that big battle on the lake bed uh, or the grass fields in uh, in Laos, uh, and don't intend to share them still. You know, I know that a lot of the interviews have done that kind of thing it's just not my interest to do such so with that i'll say thank you jason i enjoyed that hour and i'll look to one more should finish us off okay so i uh, i will say goodbye to the group don't but i won't say goodbye to you hang on because i like to to chat with you guys a little bit afterwards and uh so as far as the next one we'll do that in a, in a couple of weeks okay fine thank yeah. you very much sir Okay, adios.